By way of illustration, how many of you have ever taken a deck of cards before and, you know, just kind of got that, you know, you can do the 52 card pickup, you could play solitaire, or you could try to build the house of cards. How many of you have ever tried to build a house of cards before where you're, you're setting the cards all up, you're trying to get them to balance just so, and, uh, you know, and then all of a sudden when you think that you got something going and you could just get this just right and you got it, you know, someone comes along and the cards go everywhere, right? And you're like, dang, I, I just worked on that for 45 minutes, man. What'd you do that for? You know, building a house of cards is when you do that, you're always at risk of having those cards fall apart. And the reason that is, is because a house of cards has no significant structure. There's no significant support system that's there that will help to withstand the testings of life. You know, using cards, we can try to build things with these, but we know that they are flimsy. They are not capable to stand up to heavy pressure. And what I want you to kind of lock your mind into this, this evening is that we're all building in our life. And we're building a house. The house is us. The Word of God says that when we give our lives to Jesus Christ, that we become the temple of the Holy Spirit, the house of God, that God lives inside of us. So the imagery is there all throughout the Bible that we can build this house. You know, Paul called it a tent, but it's still the same imagery that we are building the house of our lives. So this evening, I want you to consider with me building a strong house. Out of Proverbs chapter 24, let's read verses 3 through 6. It says, Through wisdom a house is built, and by understanding it is established. By knowledge the rooms are filled with all precious and pleasant riches. A wise man is strong, yes, a man of knowledge increases strength. For by wise counsel you will wage your own war, and in a multitude of counselors there is safety. So I want you to think with me, first of all, tonight about building your house. You know, every house, like every life, has a foundation that has been or is being built upon. Now, it's easy uh, and inexpensive to build uh, something that doesn't have a solid foundation. It's really easy to just kind of throw some pieces of wood together and build a look like a little shed type house. You can pick it up and move it. I was talking to my mom uh, just yesterday and uh, she, they had just bought a new house in Idaho, just moved in, and they have a, a deck on the back, uh, and it's made out of wood. And they thought, you know, we don't really like this deck. Let's pick it up and let's move it. Let's get it out of here. Uh, but what they didn't realize was underneath that deck, what they could not see was that they had dug down, they had put concrete into the ground, uh, and they had put concrete legs down. They had laid a foundation for that deck to be built on, and when they tried to pick it up, it wasn't going anywhere because it was founded on a good foundation. But tonight, if we're not careful in our lives, we can approach building our lives uh, from that position of, I don't need to put down a solid foundation. I don't need to work very hard. I can just go at my life and I can do whatever I want to do and live however I want to live. I can be footloose and fancy free with this man. Nothing's going to hold me back. No one's going to tell me what to do. No one's going to tell me how to live. But that's a dangerous approach because that's approach. You're building a house. Yes, you're building your life. Yes, but you have no solid foundation to approach a, a building from that uh, you know, position is actually to build in, a, in the most expensive way possible. When you build without a foundation, you're setting yourself up to have that house one day fall apart. And when that house falls apart, guess what? You're building from scratch all over again. You're having to go down and pick up the pieces. That costs you something. Emotional energy, emotional strength, it costs you time in your life, right? You have to start all over. Wouldn't it be better just to build correctly from the beginning? Proverbs 12, verse 15, it says, But the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he who heeds counsel is wise. You see, when we say, I'm going to do this my way, we are taking the foolish way because it's right in our own eyes. 
Now, a lot of times the way we want to do things is not necessarily the right way because it's the flesh way. It's the way that's simple. It's the way that's easy. It's a way that doesn't require us to dig deep and to put down those foundations. Every house, like every life, is built out of materials, right? The structure is just as important as the foundation of the structure. We lived in a third world country for a while, and I've been to a number of third world countries. And one thing that I noticed is that usually the houses in third world countries are built out of scraps, uh, uh, remnants of materials, old discarded materials, uh, things that have already been past their lifespan and now they're thrown into the trash. Uh, Usually in a third world country, someone will go and take that and say, I can build with this. I remember my first experience with this was in Tijuana, Mexico. I went down there on a mission trip, uh, and as I'm sitting there looking, I'm on a hillside, and I'm looking across uh, just this massive span of people in Tijuana, Mexico. I began to realize all of the houses were built out of old pallets. They were stood on end, and they were filled with mud and straw, but that's what they built their houses out of. Uh, But I I also remember watching as these people would get up, the kids would come and they would lean on the house and the whole house would shake and rock. And it was like, wow, man, one storm, one good gust of wind, uh, one tornado, one, you know, whatever, earthquake. And that whole thing is in danger of going down. So it's not just the foundation, but it's what's on top that matters as well. It's what we're building our lives with that matters. It's exactly why we have building codes and building standards uh, uh, in our society and and, and industry standards. You know, tonight, uh, the word of God for a Christian, the word of God is our code book. It is our standard of building practices, uh, not for a building, but for our life. And in the word of God, it gives us types of examples uh, of building with good material and how that will play out the outcome of that and the building with bad material and the outcome of that life and those choices. We see that. That's why the word of God is so powerful because we don't just have success story after success story, but in there we have failure after failure, then success. That people fail, they make their mistakes, they learn their lessons. Man, I shouldn't have built with that. Now I'm going to build with this. And we see the the blessing go on. We see other stories in the word of God where people see somebody else's failure and say, hey, I don't want to build like that. I want to build a different way. And they have a life of blessing and success because of that. Proverbs chapter one, verse seven, it says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. So what he's saying is that when you uh, fear God and you say, God, I'm going to approach my life based on your word, there's wisdom there. But when you say, God, I know it's in your word, but I don't care anyways. I'm going to do my thing. Then that's, again, it's we're despising wisdom. We're despising instruction, and we're setting ourselves up for pain and ruin and hurt. Every house, like every life, will be tried and tested in some way. Life is filled with tests. I remember growing up thinking, man, I can't wait to graduate high school because that means no more tests, right? But that's not right. That's not the way life works. Life is constantly filled with tests. It's just that once you're out of high school, you're not worried about whether or not you're going to pass math or history. Like, that doesn't matter. It's whether or not I can pay my bills. It's whether or not I can make my marriage work. It's whether or not I can raise my children adequately. It's whether or not uh, I can get through this difficulty that I'm facing right now. Those tests have a whole different uh, caliber to them, right? There's a, there's a different uh, uh, weight to them. And as we get older and we start to face these world, real tests, uh, there's consequences that are associated with them that we've never faced before. There's real uh, tension there. In 1 Corinthians 3, verses 12 and 15, it says, uh, Now if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, so these are things that are going to stand the test of time. He goes on, wood, hay, straw, Each one's work will become clear, for the day will declare it, 
because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. You know what he's saying there? Is what you choose to build your life out of matters. Are you going to choose to build your life out of the simple things that can't withstand the fires and trials of life? Or are you going to build out of something different? That's I chose these, these two uh, images because you have someone building a brick house. The stone, it's going to withstand, right, versus the house of cards. And it's the life, uh, it's a picture of the life being built uh, out of godly principles and godly tenets and godly morality, you know, and, and standards for our life versus the way the world tells us to build. A home must be built uh, with the storms of life in mind. When you're living your life, when you're building your life, you have to think, now what, where is this going to take me? And what is going to be the outcome of this when the real trials and the tests start to come? How am I going to stand up against those times of life? Not when everything's good, not when all the bills are paid, but what about when all of it is falling to pieces? Am I still going to be able to stand the test of time? I remember when we moved overseas, I had a friend tell me he, he had lived on islands and we were going to a little island in the South Pacific. And I said, hey, I called him up. I said, hey, do you have any advice? You lived in Guam for however many years you were in Guam. And he said, yes, uh, one bit of advice. Uh, and, and that is, is when you pick your house, pick a house that's built out of brick. Don't pick a wood house. And I said, well, why? What's the significance of that? He says, the houses that are built out of brick, they stand up when the typhoons hit, when the hurricanes hit. But the houses that are built out of wood are quite often eaten away by termites. And they're just standing there as a structure. But when the storms come, because the termites have eaten away at the wood and weakened them, they'll fall over in the storm. And they trap people, they hurt people, because they don't have the strength to stand up against those storms. How we build our lives matters. Can you say amen? So establishing your home as we think about this secondly. In our text, what we read is un by understanding, the home is established. By understanding, it is established. Now that word established, it has a very important meaning. It means recognized, well-known, or reputable. Have you ever visited somebody's house and like the moment you walk through the door, you smell the smell of the home? Like I had a friend and every time I, I loved going to her house when I was in, in high school, we would, you know, we had our friend group and we'd hang out and I would love going over to this girl's house because every time I would walk through the door, it was like cookies or I'd walk through the door and I was like, oh man, those are brownies. That's a cake. Oh man, cinnamon rolls. Really? You see this girl's grandma lived with her and her grandma loved to bake. And so everybody loved going over to this girl's house because we knew that we were going to be received in a pleasant way. I would walk into that girl's house and the smell would tell me a story and the smell would tell me something in my own heart. I would say, ah, oh, everything's going to be okay. I'm having a bad day, but guess what? There's a cinnamon roll, <laughs> right? And that was just kind of the mindset. And then we had another friend and we would go over to their house and you would walk into the door and it didn't matter every single time. It smelled like two week, old, two week old trash. It smelled like sewer. It didn't matter when we went. It always had this stench. And you know, in our friend group, everybody kind of developed a reputation around their home. My home was called the Kool-Aid house. Because every time my friends would come over, my stepmom, she would make Kool-Aid for everybody. Hey, who wants Kool-Aid? And we'd be out playing basketball, and she would be bringing it out. And so they'd always call her the Kool-Aid mom. I love the Kool-Aid mom. But there was, there was an arena there. There was, there was an aroma there. There was, there was a recognized, well-known reputation that was associated with the house. You know, when we went over to people's houses, we knew what we were going to get. And among the friends, 
there was a reputation that we were either going to get cookies, cakes, and pies, or two-week-old trash and sewer, or somewhere in between, because there was an aroma, there was a reputation upon every home. I want you to take that little story and kind of think about that in light of your life. Because establishing your personal house, who you are, establishing your home with wisdom and understanding, it means that you are going to create a reputation for your life. Who you are. In Matthew chapter 7, verses 15 through 20, Jesus, you know, I'm not going to read that whole thing, but Jesus, he tells us that a Christian will be known by the fruit of their life. You will know who is a real Christian by the fruit of their life. You will see that there is a reputation. Yes, you say you're a Christian, but you don't have the fruits of a Christian. You don't bear the fruits of repentance. Now, this is more than just does your house smell like cookies or garbage. It really it means, does the, what does your spiritual house smell like? What does the condition of your heart look like? Does the condition of your heart look like a a warm, inviting uh, place where everything's going to be all right? Or does your heart look like two-day-old piles of trash? And man, why does it always have that sewer smell in here? Why is it always that you're negative and always, uh, it's always the worst of the worst when when, when I'm talking to you and where we're dealing with you? Proverbs 22, verse 1, it says, A good name is more desirable than great riches. To be esteemed is better than silver and gold. He's talking about a reputation, right? Can you say amen? He's saying it's good to have a good name. It's desirable to have a good reputation. In our text, it tells us that we need to be intentional to with what we bring into the home of our heart because it's going to establish that reputation. It's going to establish who we are as a person. You know, they say, uh, you know, if you allow, establish a thought and it turns into a habit, establish a habit, it turns into a lifestyle, establish a lifestyle, it turns into a character, right? Who you are. It becomes part of everything that you are as a person. And what ends up happening is who you are will impact the lives of those around you. I mean, we don't realize how far of a reach and how big of an impact we have on other people's lives until something happens and, you know, it kind of comes into our, you know, into our, uh, like a revelation comes to us like, wow, I made that much impact on your life? I didn't realize that I mattered that much to you. I didn't. I didn't realize that you were watching me that closely. I didn't realize that my words carried that much weight with you. In our text, it says, By knowledge the rooms are filled with all precious and pleasant riches. Listen, we are the people who are responsible for filling the rooms of our house. And what goes in there is our choice. Now, we can choose to fill our lives like a hoarder with all kinds of rubbish and things. Like we're just collecting anything and everything, right? Have you ever seen the... You know, the, the stories on the hoarders and you're, they're like walking in and like it's a whole gigantic house, but there's a little teeny path because they've collected so much. Is that the way our heart is? We've just taken, taken, taken and we've allowed all of this stuff to build up. Or do we have precious, pleasant things that we've, we've intentionally put things in our house because we want them to be there? We've made that decision. I, I want it. I want it like this. And if it's not something that I want, I'm going to get rid of it. I'm not just going to hold on to it just to hold on to it. I'm going to get rid of it. When we were overseas, we'd been there for about, I'd say about nine months. And you don't realize how, how nice it is to go to the store or how nice it is to sit on your couch and not have somebody looking through your window or how nice it is and, uh, to go to the store and, and you don't know anybody there. And you just do your shopping. You don't realize how nice it is to have that until it's gone. Because when you're there eating your dinner and you look over and you have a, a, an audience watching you eat your dinner, it's a little intrusive. When you're, when you're uh, going about your grocery store shopping and people are following you around just watching because they, they're curious about what you're buying. want to see 
what you're putting in your cart. They're taking notice of everything. It's called anonymity when, when you can just go do your thing and no one's watching you. You have a level of anonymity. But when you don't have that, you, you, you start to desire it. Man, I just want to like get away where, where no one knows who I am and I just want to like disconnect. I want to be able to relax. I want to let my hair down a little bit, right? And so we were feeling that. We're on this little island. People are watching our every move. Uh, and, and, and so in this village that we lived in, there was no privacy. Like literally, we would close the drapes uh, and people would be out looking through the drapes. And they weren't like perverted. Don't, don't get me wrong. We have that mindset here in the States. They were curious. What are these people doing? You're different from me. You're strange. You're from a different culture. You, you're a different color of skin. You have different language. Like they were just curious. So there was nothing malicious about it. It was actually pretty neat. It was kind of like cool to, to have that experience. But we decided we wanted to get away. So we jumped in the truck. We drive to the other side of the, the island to a village that we had never been to before. And kind of culture is when you go to a beach, you find out who owns the beach. You ask for permission to go and use their beach. And so I drove up. I saw some people outside. I got out of the truck and I said, hey, can you tell me who owns the beach over here? My family and I would like to go swimming. Oh, we own the beach. Do I have permission? Yes. Park your truck over here. Don't park underneath the coconut park over here. And, you know, they're giving us instructions of where, where to park. And so we get out. We go down to the beach. The kids are playing in the water. And Chrissy and I are just chilling on the sand. And we're talking. You know, we're having a good time watching the kids play. And I look over. And there's a whole family of people walking down the beach. And they're all carrying plates of food. They're carrying drinks, sodas, and waters. And, and, and they're bringing this whole meal. And, and I was like, what the heck is going on? You know, like I felt like we were intruding on their picnic areas, really what the first thought in my mind was. And as they get closer, they start, the kids, you know, they called the kids over. And so they started giving drinks and stuff to the kids. And I'm, I'm pulling out my wallet thinking, man, I'm going to have to pay for lunch. Like, you know, I wanted to do the right thing, but I didn't have a whole lot of money in and so I'm looking and I only have like 10 bucks. And, and so I, I go and I meet with them and I say, hey, you know, they're giving my wife food. They're giving me plates of food. And I say, hey, I only have $10. We don't want your money, Pastor. And I just stopped. I've never seen these people before in my life. I've never talked to them. I've never had an interaction with them. How do you know I'm a pastor? So I asked, so how do you know who I am? And the man, he kind of like, straightened himself up and he goes, Pastor, we watch you. Pastor, we talk about you all the time. And I want to tell you, thank you. Thank you for coming to my island. Thank you for blessing my people. Please take this small token of our appreciation with this food because we love you. It's like, I don't know you. I've never met you. But Pastor, we know you. And it just blew my mind. And I began to realize that no matter whether you like it or not, people are going to watch you and people are going to talk about you. And whether you like it or not, I hate when people talk about me. It's like, get over it. People are going to watch you and people are going to talk about you. But you know what? The reputation that you give them to talk about, it matters. The house that you build, your life, it matters. I learned that when I give attention to building my life with the precious and the pleasant things of God, no matter what people say about me, they are going to give glory to God. If when they speak about my life and my life is, you know, think about this. Because this is biblical. 1 Peter 2.12, 2, it says, Having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. The Bible says this is going to happen. But he says, man, think about this. That when they try to speak bad about you, let everything that comes out of their mouth actually be a blessing report of God in your life. Man, can you believe this guy? He's always telling people about Jesus. Okay, and, right, that's good. 
They could use it, try to slander you, but it's actually giving glory to God. If their slander is you are always telling people about Jesus, praise God, right? She's always talking about how smart other people's kids are. Okay, and that's not slanderous gossip, right? You're being a blessing. You're building other people up with your words. And them trying to speak against that, it actually only glorifies God. He's always helping people with their cars, repairing their broken sinks, doing things, cutting their grass for them. Okay, and that's so wrong to be a blessing to other people? She's always telling young girls to dress modestly. Okay, again, and like, like how is that bad? But sinners will say those things to slander you, but all they're doing is glorifying God and they are they are cementing the reality that you have laid a good foundation and you are building a good house. That you are filling your life with precious and pleasant things. Can you say amen? When you live your life to be a blessing to other people, it doesn't matter what they say about you because they're going to be saying that you are a blessing because you are a Christian. You know, let what people say being meant for an insult or a slander only bring God glory. Let that be a goal for your life. God, I want when they talk about me, I want them to talk about me in such a way that they're mad at me for being righteous. They're mad at me for doing the right thing. They're mad at me for being honest. They're mad at me, you know, can you believe that guy? He shows up to work every single day and he's on time and he's sober. Okay, <laughs> praise God for that, right? Thank you, Jesus, that I have that as a testimony because there was a time in my life where I wasn't that person. I was the person that was stealing things. I was the person showing up late. I was the person that was coming. I was the guy going behind the dumpster and taking a sneak a toke. That was me. But that's not me now because of Jesus Christ. You know, that is a house being built with wisdom and established with understanding when we say, God... Let my reputation bring glory to your name because they are going to talk. So let's close with uh, strengthening your house. Strengthening your house means that you are going to be proactive and not reactive when it comes to the things of life. That you are going to make a choice that God, I am going to purposely put things into my life that are going to be a blessing to me, my children, and the people around me. That I'm going to be proactive when it comes to this. Verses five and six of our text, it says, a wise man is strong. Yes, a man of knowledge increases strength, for by wise counsel, he will wage his own war in the multitude of counselors. There is safety. So why is he talking about building your house and then all of a sudden there's a war? You know what he's telling you there is that you are going, no matter how you go about your life, you are going to have some battles. There are going to be times where you are going to go to war. Have I mean, you ever had to deal with depression before? That's a, that's a self, that's an internal war, right? People could look at you and not even know that you are going through a living hell because you're dealing with depression, fear, it's, it's a war, right? Greed, it's a war. You know, there are temptations of the flesh that are literal battlegrounds for your soul. And what he's saying there is that wisdom is you are going to strengthen yourself with the understanding that you are going to go to war one day. And so you have to be proactive to make yourself strong. I guarantee you right now, if you knew that you were going to have to fight hand-to-hand -hand combat and wrestle with somebody in two weeks, you'd start lifting weights today. Because uh, you're going to say, I need muscles, man. I need to build myself up. I need some tactics and I need some skills. I'm going to go ask somebody how I can wrestle. I got my hair cut from a girl not too long ago. And I asked her, I said, you know, what do you do for fun around here? She was like, I joined a gym and I do jujitsu. So this little teeny girl, why do you do jujitsu? She's like, because I don't ever want to be taken advantage of. I don't ever want a guy to lay hands on me and hurt me. I want to be able to defend myself. I was like, and I told her, I said, good for you, girl. That's proactive, man. That's thinking ahead. 
that's, that's coming up with a strategy. And she goes, yeah, now look at this. Uh, and she pulls out a taser. She goes, yeah, look at this. And she pulls out pepper spray. I'm like, dang, <laughs> you're ready, man. You are prepared. She was being proactive in her self-defense. I mean, we need to do that spiritually. We need to be proactive in our self-defense. I'm going to pray today. I'm going to get the word of God in me because the battles are going to come. And I better know how to fight it. I better have something there of a strength and of a resolve. You know, this gives us a sense that we cannot be passive or naive when it comes to our walk with God. But that we have to have an intentional aggression that we are going to build ourselves up to do the battles and the business of the, th the things of God. We need to guard and protect our hearts and our minds, uh, planning to do right, planning to stay away from things and from people that will tempt us to do the wrong things and weaken us. You know, there was a time where, you know, I was, my, my wife and I were having marriage problems and we're struggling with some things. And I, you know, I, I told her, I said, you know, honey, I never planned for this to happen. And she said, yeah, but you never planned for it not to. And you know, man, it hit me like a ton of bricks. So you're right. I never planned for it to happen, and I never planned for it not to. And you know what she was telling me is that you didn't build barriers to guard your heart. You didn't establish personal convictions. You know, I can't, I can't establish convictions for any of you girls you're going to have to do that. You're going to go to high school. You're going to go to college maybe, and you're going to be tested. You better have your own personal convictions. I can't establish convictions for any of you adults. Uh, you better have those personal convictions uh, when the Christmas party comes uh, and, the, and the liquor's flowing and things are happening. You better have some convictions that say, you know what? I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to be around that because I know I will only be weakened. I'm going to purposely make the decision to, to exclude myself from some things so that I don't fall back, so that I am not put in a place of compromise. You know, we must also be intentional and cautious with who we allow to speak into our lives. We have to make an intentional decision that I'm not just going to listen to everybody. Our text talks about a multitude of counselors, but you better be careful about who those counselors are. In James 1, verse 5, it says, if, you, if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. God wants to give us wisdom. Godly wisdom comes through the Word of God. It comes through preaching. Godly wisdom sometimes comes through life lessons and experience. But quite often, godly wisdom comes through another godly person. It comes through a conversation where you, you sit down with somebody. Hey, man, let's go have a cup of coffee. Look, I'm dealing with this. Will you pray for me? What do you have, you know, as far as insight in a marriage, in a finances, in, in you know, a relationship, in a work situation, you, right? Raising our kids, man. There's so many times where I called another Christian, like, you know, how do I raise my kids with a balance of discipline and love? And I, I had to have someone speak into my life. But I made sure that who I reached out to for counsel was someone that I could trust was a Christian. Someone that would point me to the Word of God. Somebody that would give me wise and good counsel. And there, were gonna, there will be times uh, uh, when God comes and He tries to, to, to give you direction. And you have to be willing to, to receive it too. Because sometimes godly counsel is going to come to you maybe from a person that you don't necessarily like or want to receive counsel from. I'm mad at you because of A, B, and C. I don't want you to speak to my X, Y, and Z, right? And so we have to be careful because sometimes God can give us and being depositing the gold and the silver and those, those precious things through somebody that we don't necessarily want to receive it from. And if we're not careful, we can actually miss godly wisdom because of a of, of pride issue. So we have, to, we have to have this balance that I'm not just going to listen to anybody, but I'm going to be willing to, to listen to who God sends me as well. You know, in life, there are going to be some battles to fight. And before you die on the wrong battlefields, wisdom says ask questions. Wisdom says before you make that big decision, ask questions. Before you get wrapped up with that boy or that girl, ask questions. Before you get wrapped up in that job that's going to take, ask 
questions. Seek God and be willing to listen to godly counsel. Godly counsel, amen, to weigh in on things in your life is helpful. Ephesians 5, as we, we're closing down, look carefully then at how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. You know, we're living in some wicked days. And he tells us to be wise with the way that we're walking in this world. Don't be unwise, be wise. Don't be foolish, be un, unfoolish, right? Be, be wis, be, be, have understanding and be a person of wisdom. I close with this thought many times. We are the strongest and the wisest when we are the quietest. Many times when we choose to listen, that's when we're the strongest and when we're the wisest. Many times when we choose not to speak back rail for rail, I have something to say, I'm going to get the last word. Many times when we let the other person speak and we listen, that's when we're the strongest and that's when we're the wisest. When we, through self-control and through principle, hold our tongue on a matter, we hold our tongue in a tense situation, we hold our tongue about a sensitive topic, and we know it's not the right timing. Have you ever, we've all done this, right? We know it's the wrong timing, but we're going we're gonna to bring this up anyways. Maybe that's not always the wisest thing to do. Maybe sometimes the wisest thing to do is just, hey, man, I'm going to table that for a minute. It's not the right time to have that conversation. It's not the right time to deal with that issue. But maybe, maybe it's just time for me to be quiet and listen. And that's actually real strength. That's real control. That's real wisdom. You know, tonight we have a choice to make. Are we spending all of our time and energy trying to build houses out of cards? Are we giving ourselves to things that are just going to literally fall apart? Or are we using wisdom, using understanding, using knowledge? Are we saying, you know what, I'm not going to build with this because this will be tested and it will not stand up. But instead, I'm going to build with something that has withstood the test of time. I'm going to build my life with something that will strengthen me, that will help me. And I'm going to put into my heart those precious and those pleasant things that only come from God. Amen. What are you building with tonight? I encourage you to build a strong house through wisdom and understanding. Let's bow our heads.